that God can use you mightily to bless other people and then you go home and almost need medication to deal with your own problems? Isn't it something that God will give you a prophetic word to tell somebody how to circumvent their life but then you go home wondering how you're going to make it to the next day? Y'all not going to talk to me. God can give you a word to deliver that brings clarity to somebody else's situation. But then you go home wondering yourself, how in the world am I going to make it out? I became aware of the fact that I was called to preach around the age of nine years old. I encountered a man named Evangelist John David Lawrence from New Jersey who used to frequent my father's ministry and would run revivals. Um, he called me, one of the last times he came, he called me out and prayed for me and told me that I was going to pastor, I was going to preach, I was going to be a prophet and travel uh, preaching the gospel. But unfortunately, I did not accept that call at that time. It wasn't until I was the age of 23 years old that I accepted my call. Um, I think the enemy, well, I don't think, I know. The enemy fights every potential change agent to a generation with fear. Um, always what will happen. We're more familiar and more comfortable with our yesterday than we are with, with our tomorrow. Um, I'm an introverted person. I'm shy. I was born with a speech impediment. I stutter at times. So I didn't see any reason why God would call me to preach. And then one thing that, that stuck out to me it was so funny. I used to watch my father do funerals and I had a fear of dead bodies. So I said there was no way in the world I was going to be a preacher and I'd have to preach a funeral. Uh, but bottom line even to that was fear. Not wanting to fail. Not wanting to really conform my life where I lost control. My mentor beside my natural father uh, was a man named Prophet Nathan L. Simmons. Um, he was a man who taught me the power of prayer, taught me the power of travail. And he became my father once my natural father deceased. He has been the biggest role model to date. I admire men like, you know, Bishop Thomas Jakes and Bishop Noel Jones, but I don't know them personally. Nathan Simmons was a man who, who laid hands on me and laid on the altar with me for hours. So if I had to credit anybody with being my biggest influence, it would be Pastor Nathan L. Simmons. My preaching style, uh, it's hard to label. It's hard to label. I love to preach. It's the most comfortable time that I have in my life. I don't, I'm not a talkative person outside of the pulpit. So preaching to me, um, it's really my God time because it puts me in a zone that I know I would never be in of my own want and my own desire. Um, I love the style of preaching. You know, I listen to old Baptist preachers all day long. So I, I love that Southern Baptist style. To put a label on it, it's, it's kind of difficult. You just got to hear it, and I, I think you'll enjoy it. Say you don't know the, what I've been through. Huh? Tell them you don't know what happened to me this year. Should have lost my mind, but the Bible said, Yeah, Lord, it said, for I reckon that the suffering, help me here, of this present time, to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Somebody open up your mouth and just shout glory. It's one of my desires to um, teach people to use their pain as power. So whatever, you, whatever you've gone through personally, I think that that's a stage that God has set for you to be able to come to minister to somebody who still may be in that situation. Um, if you were an unwed mother, you can help somebody else who's going down that path or help somebody else avoid that. If you've been in prison, you can help somebody who's coming out of prison or keep some of these young guys from going in. So that, that's my thing. T tap into what's inside of you and use what you've been through to get where you're supposed to be. My experience becoming a Muslim uh, was a diabolical path that God intersected. I say that because the enemy knew who I was supposed to be or who God had intended for me to be and he wanted to do all that he could to pull me out of the church to prevent me from ever realizing that destiny. 
Um, I had become disenchanted with the church because I didn't feel like they spoke to me as a young black man. My father's church was in South Jamaica, Queens, right across the street from 40 Projects. Uh, we had nobody lighter than 1159 in my church, but behind my father's pulpit, there was a picture of a Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, I had a problem reconciling that. In reconciling that, the Nation of Islam offered me what I thought was an opportunity to be empowered as a black man, and that's how they were able to get my attention, and I agreed with them and walked away from God for a while. I turned to selling drugs. Um, I had become so monstrous that I was selling drugs inside my father's church. The youth pastor used to work for me. Uh, we would exchange product on Sundays during church meetings. One Friday night, um, I was supposed to be in church because no matter if I thought I was Muslim, if I thought I was Nation of Islam, if I thought I was a God, I had to go to church. My father's rule was if you were going to be a hypocrite, you were going to be the most professional hypocrite the world had ever seen because you were going to church. So this Friday night, instead of going to church, I, I delayed it and went with a quote unquote friend for a drug deal uh, on 115th Road in South Jamaica right off of Sufton Boulevard. During that drug deal, uh, the person I went with had owed a balance and shorted them some money. They pulled him out of the car and proceeded to beat him for everything that he was worth. I had a gun. I carried a, a, a nine millimeter. I had a gun underneath the driver's seat of my car. I went to reach for my gun, and when I picked my head back up, a uh, guy had a gun to my head and told me, I'm gonna kill you tonight, you're gonna die. Um, in that instant, um, I began to ask God to get me out of it, not because of a fear of my own life, but because I didn't want my parents to have to come to the morgue and identify their only son that had been killed in a drug deal. Um, during, I, I, it seemed like an eternity, but it could have only been a matter of seconds. He pulled the trigger and the gun didn't fire. He cocked the gun and he pulled the trigger again and it didn't fire. He did this three times. Lastly, last time he looked at me, he said, it's your lucky night, I guess you're gonna live. He told me to pull off, which I did. He didn't have to tell me twice. I pulled off and as I was pulling off, I looked in the rearview mirror and saw him holding a gun up in the air, firing shots into the air. Those were the bullets that were meant to be inside my head, but God intercepted it because I still had a purpose on my life. I converted back to Christianity uh, based, nestled on the scripture that says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. My parents embedded Christianity in me from my earliest memories. I could never come to grips with saying Allah was God or that I as a black man was God. Um, I'm, I'm an avid reader and I sat down with my Bible and the Quran and was able to reconcile the Bible with the, with the timeline and history books, something you can't do in the Quran. So I, I got a respect for the church that I didn't have before because my experience with the church was through my parents. At this point, my experience became personal and my road through discovery led me to come in contact with the compassion of Jesus Christ. And I don't think anybody who really experiences that kind of pure love can turn away and act like they don't care anything about it. For the oil of the Lord shall pour upon ministry gifts. Those who have sat in pews frustrated with a prophetic word those who have served frustrated knowing a word from the Lord rest in their belly. God sends rescue tonight. Uh, the Lord told me when I started pastoring that he was not going to make me a pastor of normal means. I didn't understand what that meant. Uh, I thought on Sunday morning, you know, I would look up and the pews would be full, the chairs would be full, full but I was sorely disappointed because that didn't happen. The Lord began to tell me, do what nobody else is doing and you'll receive what nobody else is receiving. So there was a time when the first Friday of every month, I would have a midnight service. When everybody was home, uh, most people were sleeping, we would be in church till three, four o'clock in the morning. People would be leaving the club and come past the church and hear the music and then come inside. Uh, the, the church now where we are in Canarsie, we're surrounded by a couple of shelters. So the people from the shelters now trust us enough that they come in and they fill up the church on Sunday. Um, I ask God that by the end of this summer, 
that there be standing room only here. And we have to go to more than one service on a Sunday morning. Not because we want to, because God knows I don't want to get up any earlier than I already do. But if it's a necessity, then I'll do it. For the church to answer the call uh, that Jesus gave us before he left and said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, I really think the church needs to be saved again. Uh, we're trying to promote a medicine to the world that doesn't work for us. Um, we're so adept to swiping our grace ATM card that living holy is now a thing of the past. You don't even hear it anymore. It's about good credit. It's about the house that you live in or the car that you drive. Um, if, if the church is going to impact the world, we have to get our message back. And the only way for us to get our message is to be uh, partakers of our own medicine. It has to work for us. We have to change our lifestyles. We have to do what the Lord said do. Go back to praying. Go back to fasting. Go back to Bible study, not just scripture quotation, but studying the Bible, laying before the Lord and asking God for direction. Heal our spirits. Heal our emotions. Heal our ministries. Heal, Lord. Heal, Lord. Heal, Lord. Heal, Lord. Rebuke cancer. Rebuke cancer. Your spirit of infirmity. We drive you out. Rebuke heart disease. In the name of the Lord Jesus. I met my wife at a concert. Um, I used to do music, um, secular and church, but let's just talk about the church for a minute. And I had a group and someone brought her to go out on a uh, engagement that the group had and she came and that's how we met. Uh, my kids and I have a, a very good relationship that I sit down and I talk to them. And in talking, I tell them where I've been, what I've been through, and the fact that certain things are inevitable for them because of who their father is. Uh, the priesthood runs through the bloodline. So just as my father was, I am, just as I am, they will do something in ministry. I don't know if it's to preach, I don't know if it's to pastor, I don't know if it's to work in administration of the church, but they'll do something. And I think as all parents, every, every parent has a duty to speak into their child. Uh, to give them principles that go even beyond the church, economically, socially. Fathers need to talk to their daughters, talk to their sons. Mothers need to talk to their daughters and sons. And that just gives a, a, a barrier of protection so that even if they leave, they can't go but so far, and that voice will always echo in them. In five years, I'm praying for the ministry to be a stable force in the community. Um, Walking up and down the street one day outside here, I encountered a young lady who told me the reason why she doesn't come inside the church is because every time she passes the church, the church comes outside and they pass her. So in five years, I, I want to extend the heart of the ministry to the people um, by way of daycare facilities, after school programs, uh, mentoring programs. I believe people don't care how much you know unless you first let them know how much you care.
and just give them a good smile and tell them congratulations on surviving the worst season of your life. Come on, look at somebody else and tell them congratulations on surviving the worst season. of your life.